Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Mysteries and Disappearances video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's wrap up this series here with this final entry. I'll give this series a rest and then start focusing on another new series here. I like to give these a limited set of videos too because there's just so much sadness associated with the material. This is another case where there's almost like a what if associated with it. Like what if the only person that saw the abductor could have described more information about the abductor themselves. More on that in a minute, but if that would have been answered, so much mysteriousness tied to this disappearance would have been absolutely unveiled. But because it just remains so frustratingly limited, then to this day, 70 plus years later, there's just still so much unknown answers tied to this case. It's again just a perfect example of how frustrating these disappearances can be. But you're looking at a picture of the young woman there. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll talk about this case, which is the disappearance of Dorothy Forstein. So who was Dorothy Forstein? Well, she was someone that was born back in 1909, originally born as Dorothy Cooper. Not much information as far as her early life other than this. Somewhere during her childhood, I'm guessing into her teen slash young adult years, that's when she had a childhood sweetheart, a guy by the name of Jules Forstein. She eventually married him, and they had three kids together, two of them, Myrna and Marsa, and then another one, uh, Edward, who was apparently from a previous marriage as well, but in other words, became more of a stepchild right then and there. But yes, they were having a happy family, as it seemed. They lived there in an area called, a, uh, in Philadelphia, specifically in an area at 1835 North Franklin Street. So how about that? If those of you know exactly where that is. Keep that in mind next time you're passing by the house because this is again where apparently all of this occurred, this tragedy in other words. And this gentleman, Jules Forstein, was enjoying a prosperous career. He was a magistrate for that location. He was having a, prof a blossoming professional life. And then from it, of course, the family was enjoying some good success as well as Dorothy becoming a happily married mother with her, child with her three children there. And apparently they moved there to that specific area in Philadelphia because well, not only was it a great place to be able to raise a family, but it was also very safe. There was very little crime that was apparently associated there. So nothing could have prepared them for initially what happened on one attack and then, of course, what eventually led to her disappearance. So as it goes, on January 25th, 1945, Dorothy was just doing some nonchalant errands. Apparently, she was dropping her children off at a neighbor's house. She was doing Doing some shopping and then as she returned home which was nearly dark time at that point that's when all of a sudden she was attacked by an unknown stranger this unknown stranger attacked her and then brutally beat her unconscious she was able to retaliate just a little bit I guess because she was reaching for a telephone which was at its base and then whenever that uh, telephone was removed she was able I guess to be to talk to the operator at least enough to alert the operator about what was going on and then of course during the commotion the sounds that were being heard the operator quickly alert, alerted the police and they were able to come by afterward when they came to that house that's when they found her there on the ground basically unconscious she had a broken nose a broken jaw a shoulder that was fractured she was rushed to the hospital and then finally when she was awake and she was able to give some explanation about what occurred her exact words were someone jumped out at me I couldn't see who I was he just hit me and hit me that's the thing though she could not describe who this person was at all whoever did it absolutely concealed them themselves just until the right moment and then when that happened that's when the attack occurred and she had no eyewitness recollection of it afterward closest link was apparently a neighbor saw her return home initially saw that there was someone 
closely walking behind her and then thought that not, not really much of it because in that case it was dark and the neighbor thought that maybe it was the, the husband or someone else that Dorothy was familiar with. But either way though, because it was a super safe neighborhood, something I mentioned again a minute ago, she didn't think too much of it afterward. And then of course when the attack was uh, had happened and the police were interviewing the neighbors, that's when she gave more information of it. Unfortunately, she could not provide a clear detail as to what occurred, much like Dorothy, again, could not provide a clear detail of the actual person as well. And so there were some theories there as to what occurred, like why did that happen to Dorothy, at least the initial attack? The most prominent theory is this. Because Mr. Forstein was, again, a magistrate and a judge, the idea was that maybe one of his cases, somebody that he prosecuted, somebody that he put away in jail, this could have been someone that had held a grudge against him ever since. And so because of it, the idea was they waited for, again for the right opportunity. And then uh, at that point, with his wife basically being home alone, I believe at that night, uh, by herself coming in into the house, that's when they waited and then they attacked and then that's what led to it. What leads further credence to it is the fact that Mr. Fornstein had a solid alibi, so he was ruled out as a suspect. And then also there was nothing stolen. So the idea of something as far as a robbery causing this attack, nothing was, was stolen. So the idea, again, is that it was truly, truly personal. And, of course, with uh, Mrs. Forstein, with Dorothy, having no known enemies, nobody that had a grudge against her specifically, fingers were pointing instead at what her husband might have done during his profession, and that was that. Now, cut to a couple of years later, four years afterward, uh, that's when the next tragic occurrence uh, happened. During that time period, though, during those four years, apparently Dorothy had become extremely paranoid about what happened to her. You couldn't blame her, of course. There she was, constantly on guard, looking about, watching her shoulders, always locking doors and windows, never really venturing out after the dark. In fact, her husband also took extra steps, too. He seldom left both his wife and his children alone because he wanted to make sure, again, that nothing like that could have occurred afterward. But as it happened on that fateful night on October 18th, 1949, that's when circumstances caused him, Mr. Forenstein, to be away at a political banquet, banquet. And then his oldest child, who was 19 years old at the time, Myrna, she was also visiting friends at the time too. So essentially that left only his wife and his two younger children there at the house, the younger children, Edward, and then Marcy. And then as it occurred, um, uh, Dorothy was making some phone calls. In fact, um, they were able to speak to each other, uh, Mr. Forstein and then his wife. They were able to, he was calling in on her to see how things are going. And then the last thing that he'd heard from her, almost in like a joking, jovial type manner, is that when she said, be sure to miss me. And then that's when she hung up the phone, obviously not realizing, of course, just how sad those words would be afterward. And then as it turns out, she turned, she called another friend. They were trying to arrange a shopping trip the next day. That was around now, 9 p.m. or so. She would actually be, that, that friend, whoever that was that spoke to Dorothy, would actually be the last known person to have, to have talked to Dorothy before her disappearance. And so that's, again, makes that particular phone call also very, very tragic. Cut to about 11.30 p.m. That's when Mr. Forstein came back home. And then much to his horror, much to his shock, that's when he saw that there was his two young children, Edward and Marcy. They were in the bedroom crying, and then one of them was stating that mommy's gone. Like they were screaming that mommy's gone, mommy's gone. And so when he went to inspect the area, he saw indeed that Dorothy was gone. She was nowhere there. He checked with the neighbors. Uh, nobody had seen her. He checked with friends. Nobody had seen her. He telephoned other people, anyone he could think of to try to figure out what occurred. Nobody had seen her at all. And then finally, he was getting in touch with the police, along with the detective, and then a captain as well. It seems like these were some of the people that, that he had become familiar with from the attack a couple, you know, four years earlier. They, in turn, started a huge search. They wanted to find out what happened. They checked hospitals. They checked hotels. They tragically you know, checked morgues as well. They went door-to-door -to, -door to the neighbors to try to see if anyone saw anything. Nobody did. 
did nothing. Like nobody saw anything. Nobody heard anything. Um, the only thing they could find was somewhere in the house. There was Dorothy's purse. There were her keys. And then interestingly enough, the door was locked. The front door was locked whenever uh, the, the, the gentleman, Mr. Fornstein, had come home. So whoever did the abduction... It carefully noted to lock the doors to make sure that everything was okay. In other words, it looked okay and that nothing was amiss. But then finally, nine-year-old Marcy was was interviewed. In other words, she was asked, you know, what was what was happening, what had gone on. She was able to state, and again, she remains pretty much the only eyewitness to the abduction. She stated that she was asleep at the time, at that night, but then she was woken up by the sound of someone entering the house. I'm guessing like it was the telltale sound of the door opening, closing, you know, the front door, the way it makes that sound. And when she went out into the hallway to investigate, that's when she saw a man coming up the stairs right towards her area. And as she saw it, she didn't recognize who this person was. She had no idea who this person was, what they were doing there. But at that point, she did see her mom, Dorothy, and she was lying right there in the bedroom, face down, under Unconscious. Once again, in other words, she had been the victim of another attack. This time she was unconscious and she was right there by the bedroom. And then he, he, she saw this anonymous man, whoever this was, someone that was described as being middle age. He had a brown peaked cap. And then that was about it. Like that was the only thing she could really describe with regards to him. He, she saw him pick up the mother, put the mother over her shoulder, over the, you know, the shoulders of this guy. And then as he walked out again, carrying the mother over the shoulders, uh, the daughter Marcy asked, what are you doing? And then that's when he replied, and it was kind of creepy reading this, but he replied almost like in a sing-song fashion. He said, go back to sleep, little one. Your mother is all right. And then actually patted Marcy on the head. And then she, Marcy saw this anonymous guy, whoever this unknown person was, pretty much walk out with his with the mother, Dorothy, limp on the shoulders throughout the front door, locked the front door. And that was it. That was the very last instance that she ever saw of her mother. Whoever this person was, again, had done the attack, had done it in a fashion that was very quick, again, considering what occurred between the time that Marcy woke up and then what she saw was happening and then had carried the mother limp on a shoulder, on his shoulder, in other words, straight out the front door, never ever to be seen again. And then that's pretty much it. That was the actual disappearance of Dorothy Forstein. Again, theories remained as to who this person was. The number one idea was, once again, that this was someone that had hold or held a grudge for Mr. Fornstein, somebody, again, that he had prosecuted and somebody that wanted to create just pure vengeance, pure revenge, in other words, for what occurred to them. Because once again, there was no robbery. There was nothing else in terms of any other motive. Only person attacked was Dorothy. And this was at the perfect opportune time whenever she was there by herself with the children asleep, in other words, and there was no way for her to defend herself because the gentleman, Mr. Forenstein, was away from the house just on that particular night. It definitely shows a clear cut motive by whoever this person was that they did this waiting for that exact moment. Remember, it was uh, that, that he was at a political banquet during that evening. Otherwise, he would have been home. How would this person, whoever this anonymous abductor was, what luck would they have if they had done this just randomly on this night of all nights? No, this clearly was planned out, and then that way it could ensure that they could do what they did as far as the abduction with no hindrance. Like there was absolutely nothing bothering them because they also probably realized that the young children would have been there, but at the age that the young children were, they wouldn't have been any of concern. Plus, again, it goes back to being like really, really creepy how somebody like this could clearly have attacked an adult woman, beat her unconscious, carried her, taking her who knows where to do who knows what, but at the same time was patting the younger 
girl on the head in a very soft fashion, like in a careful, caring fashion, telling them to go back to sleep. Like that's the kind of stuff, again, that just gives nightmares. But yeah, as far as that, that was the actual disappearance of Dorothy Forstein. Never ever seen again. Actually, a number one suspect, I mentioned this earlier, but even then it's grasping at straws, was a guy by the name of Morris and Move. There's a long story associated with why he's a suspect, but I'll, I'll sum it up quickly. Essentially, he was in a crowd for a political rally. Policemen arrested him because he looked to them, quote unquote, threatening. His mannerisms were threatening. And so because of it, they arrested him for that and then signing a riot and then also disorderly conduct. He was eventually fined $10 and then he was let go. But during the meantime, he actually claimed that these very two officers beat him. And not only that, but they beat him bad for 20 minutes. So in turn, those two officers were arrested. They were held on a $1,000 bail. And then as it turns out, whenever the case went to a judge, that judge dropped all the charges associated with the officers. And then that left that guy, Morris and Move, in a position where what he was trying to do was essentially kaput, like nothing else could be done for it. Guess who that judge was? That was Jules Forstein. That was Dorothy Forstein's husband. So that's the case. That's the one that people most point to, the theory that this guy, Morris Anmuth, was the one who not only did the abduction, but also most likely did the attack four years earlier. Both of them clear retaliations, clear revenge, no other motives possible. And so that's the going notion that he was the one that did it. Who knows if the police ever interviewed him afterwards. Someone might have to fill in that information see if that that was done but in either case um if it if they did interview if they didn't there's been nothing like after 70 plus years there hasn't been a single shred of evidence no trace whatsoever of what happened to dorothy forstein once she was taken out of that house again limp on the shoulders of that anonymous man Nobody ever saw her ever, ever again. So pretty sad stuff again. But if anybody has any more info, anything else I might have missed, please post those comments below. What about anyone there from the Philadelphia area? Maybe if you have more information on the local side, then please post those comments too. All right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care.